Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Unstoppable. I am your host, Kerwin Ray, and on today's episode, this is a biggie, and it's actually going to get a little bit heavy. We sit down with Stacey Curry. Now, Stacey Curry is an incredible woman. Not only is she a featured guest reporter on the Channel 9 Morning Show, featured on The Circle, The Carrie Ann Show, Anna Karen Affairs, and The Herald Sun, it's where her story gets interesting. She grew up in Housing Commission and survived domestic violence how long having two children by the time she was 21. Today, she's the co-founder of Brandprint Australia, which is a million dollar printing organization. And she's been nominated for the Telstra Businesswoman of the Year Awards. This one's a little heavy, but it is incredibly deep. And for those of you who are having tough times or have been tough times, this lady's gonna inspire you. Listen up. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome to Unstoppable, Stacey Curry. Stacey, thank you for coming in. Oh, no, thank you for having me. It's yeah. an absolute pleasure. Now, Stacey, I say this to everyone. Um, for, for people who perhaps don't know anything about you or your story, uh, I know you do a lot of speaking. You've, um, you've actually built yourself your own business. Tell people a little bit about your story and, and, and what got you to here. Uh, yes, yeah, so... I've got quite a, you know, story of um, naughty girl comes good kind of thing. So you're a bit of a bad um, girl. Yeah, a bit of a bad girl. Bad girl comes good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, oh, look, long story short, you know, I grew up in, in housing commission without my mum. Yeah. I grew up with dad and um, he was, you know, pretty dysfunctional. Um, he had no idea how to raise children and he's been left with these two babies and, yeah, grew up in housing commission I uh, lived in a shed at 14 out the da- back of dad's house and then I was pregnant at 15 and then I was homeless at 19 with two babies. And wow. then the age of 21, I was, you know, had three babies and living in domestic violence. So yeah, that's the long story short. And current day, you run a business? Yeah. So I've got five kids, um, run a business and just, yeah, love life. And so what's the business that you run now? <laughs> so it's a large format digital printing company. Okay. So we do a lot of the you know, retail displays. If you walk into a shopping centre like, you know, Colesmire or something, we do all the um, printing. and. So you've built quite a significant empire from what I've seen. Yeah. Oh, look, it, it, to me, it's an empire. It's yeah. to, to my competitors, it might not be, but to me, it's something I never thought was possible. So, um, yeah. And so I, I guess if we go back to the, 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 the 15-year-old girl who was pregnant with her first child, did you ever see yourself running a, a business like you are today? No way. I was off the rails. God, I was off the rails up until, you know, my 20s when I had to pull my head in. You know? Yeah, right. I had to pull my head in. So it sounds like you've experienced a lot of adversity. So what was it that was going on for you in your teens that kind of you know, threw you off the rails? I think, look, everyone's, I think a lot of people, not everyone, but I think a lot of people have an off the rails story. Yeah. Some is a little bit more dramatic than others. You know, yeah. some involve, you know, a little bit more, you know, fun and games than others. But I'm curious to know, like, what was your story during your teens that kind of threw you off the rails? I think um, just li- growing up in dysfunction, like I had no rules or boundaries at home. Yeah, like, right. No rules whatsoever. You know, I absolutely, my childhood, I had a lot of shit going on. You know, there was a lot of fear there in some situations. But growing up with dad, who was like a child, was the best childhood anyone can have because I literally had no rules. Um I could do what I want when I wanted with who I wanted. Yeah, right. And so I struggled at school with rules. You know, if the teacher's telling me to do something, I'd tell them to go get effed, you know, and and I didn't care because if they told dad, my dad would say, oh, God, they're whinging, you know. So I just didn't care. I had no fears. I had no worries, nothing. I was a reckless child. But you're a little bit fearless. Absolutely. You know, it's kind of interesting. It's almost counterintuitive how people think, you know, the kids, especially teenagers, think, you know, they'd love to live in a life where there were no rules, where there were no boundaries. But that in itself does produce the high level of dysfunction. It's actually quite unhealthy, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I I had no barriers to, to, you know, there was nothing that would stop me. I mean, I remember being just a child and there was this huge cliff called Paringa, you know, in New South Wales where I lived, where I grew up. And all the Big kids used to jump off it and dad, you know, I said, can I jump off it? And dad's like, no, no, no. And um, me and my brothers just snuck down there and off we jump off this huge massive ass cliff. And there was no, <laughs> you know, there was no fear in, in my life whatsoever. Um, and we were so poor, like we were so poor growing up. We had nothing, no money. I mean, there were, dad used to have a jacket and he called it his flogging jacket and he'd flog, you know, hot chickens and ham and salamis <laughs> and, and put a hole, cut holes in his jacket, you know, and. And, um, wow. yeah, and we had, 
you know, our food was every Sunday, the bakery, whatever they didn't sell, we'd go and get. And we'd have garbage bags of this bread on our kitchen dining room floor. And that was, you know, if it, if it was stale, we just freaking zapped it in the microwave. That's That was the lunch for the next week. Yeah. And I actually remember I used to go and stay at my boyfriend's house. And every time I'd go there, he'd get dinner. And I'm like, how come you get dinner every night? Like every night I come here, you get dinner. <laughs> <laughs> What's so this scam? Know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, you know, that's I just that was just my upbringing. So did at any point did did you get involved in drugs or alcohol or? Oh look, I've tried marijuana, but yeah. I never did any. I got paranoid. Um, didn't like it at all. Yeah. Uh, definitely a party chick. I used to drink, you know. Thursday, Fridays and Saturday nights, uh, not all the time, but yeah. I, because I was allowed to do it. I never smoked cigarettes. Like I was allowed to smoke cigarettes. Dad didn't care if I did drugs. So I never did it. I never got addicted to alcohol. I never got addicted to drugs and That's I've never smoked cigarettes. That's interesting because what's what I find interesting is because a lot of people who grow up in highly dysfunctional um, families, they often do turn to drugs. They often do turn to alcohol as a way to, you know, almost medicate themselves from the dysfunction that's going on. But it was almost contrary for you. Like you had so many limitations, so so much freedom that there was no restriction, that there was almost no appeal to do that. That's kind of interesting. Oh, absolutely. And I lived in a shed, as I said, out the back. And my friends would come over and they came from strict families. And they'd come to my shed (laughs) <laughs> and they'd be all smoking bongs because they could and I never did because I just, it, to me, it was just nothing, you know, I didn't care. You know, it's interesting you say that because I remember when I was a kid, my dad used to buy, I don't know if you remember this, but you used to have to be able to get this beer that was had like a 0.001% alcohol. It was basically brewed soft drink. Yeah. And my old man used to buy it and give it to us, give us one can for lunch and one can for <laughs> dinner because he wanted us to basically have the experience of having a beer with lunch and a beer with dinner. And so I never felt like I was missing out. And so all the way, fast forward through high school, very similar to yourself, I was never attracted to alcohol because I never felt like it was withheld from me. Yeah. You know, even though it was only brewed soft drink, um, I never felt like I was actually missing out. So at what point did you start to did you start to realize that, you know, things had to change and you wanted to turn this around? Oh, look, that wasn't until I had three kids and DHS got involved and forced me and told me I would lose my kids if I don't change my life. Is that right? So what age were you when that happened? 21. And was there some kind of a significant event that led to uh, Department of Housing Services, right? Yeah, yeah. So what? So I was 15 and I fell pregnant. But growing up, I was kicked out of class every single day. Every day I was kicked out of class for disruptive behaviour. Um like the principal even gave me a chair to sit on because <laughs> he didn't want me to get piles from sitting on the cold floor. And um, so every day I was kicked out. And so whenever sex education would come, you know, I'd get the condoms, blow them up, be a dick. And so I was always <laughs> kicked out and I didn't understand I to this. how to get pregnant. Like I didn't know any of this stuff, right? Yeah, right. So I end up, I, when I lived in the shed, <laughs> my dad, he's got a really big fat tummy. And anyone, all of my friends, if you knocked on my front door, dad would answer the door and whatever colour jocks he's wearing, you'd see a little triangle because his gut's over, hanging over in the, you know, blue triangle, red triangle, whatever colour jocks. So there was a running joke with my friends that if you knock on Stacey's door, the dad will be answering in his jocks. So one day I walked from the shed down to dad's house and he was standing in the kitchen just wearing his jocks and um, he was showing me the hernia on his belly button and I'm like, shit, dad, I've got one of those too, you know, and he's like, oh, shit, love, you better get it checked out. So I went to the doctors and that's when I found out I was pregnant. That's, it was a baby. It wasn't a hernia. Not a hernia. <laughs> so I went back to Dad's and I'm like, shit, Dad, I threw So the we're talking, it. you must have been like at a later stage of pregnancy for the belly button yeah, to pop I out. Think it, oh, look, I don't think it was really late. I do know my second one I was 18 weeks pregnant without knowing. But the yeah, first one, right. I don't remember with the first one, but I do know my tummy was protruded like my belly button was out. Um <laughs> Wow. And, I shouldn't laugh, but that's... that's <laughs> oh, yeah, and I yeah. had no idea. Wow. And Dad, I ran home and threw the test at Dad and Dad goes out and buys a cask of wine to celebrate my pregnancy. Like this wow. is... Wow. <laughs> that's it, you know, and um, so and I just still continued climbing trees, going on my bikes. I had a bike off the hard rubbish. I had a pink bike. You know, I'd just go everywhere. I still continued school um, and then... So, yeah, I still went to school because I was the poorest out of all of my friends and they used to always have the cross colour and the country road jumpers and all the things that were in the Stussy pant, you know, and I wanted that too. So I got a job in a factory putting together Easter egg hampers and stuff like that um, to earn money so that I could have the same clothes as them. And um, and then I'd clean, I'd 
get all the kids because dad used to babysit a heap of kids and I had all these kids in my house like Will Ferrell and I'd go and knock on all the doors and make a sale and get the kids to clean the houses and then go in and, and make money by cleaning the whole house. But you get the kids to clean the houses for you? Yeah, and then I'd take them down hustle. and get them lunch, you know, and, and yeah, share right. them lunch with the money. And um, and so on the side I had the – so I was attending school and I was um, working at the East Egg factory on the Saturday and that was my 70 bucks I'd earn or something. And I'd buy some, you know, country road jumpers or something or dad would flog them for me, whatever. <laughs> he, he used to flog everything <laughs> for me. Um, and, yeah, and so then I ended up <coughs> moving out when I was 17 and found out I was pregnant again. And that was when I was 18 weeks again. I just had wow. no, no idea. <laughs> so. And so at 18 you've got your first child, boy or girl? So he was a boy. Yeah. So I had him at 16, just turned 16 and uh, took him to school with me. So every day I'd walk to school, catch wow. the train, take him to school, come home. And after school I worked at a cafe. <coughs> so by this stage I'd moved up in the world out of a factory into a cafe. Dad would meet me in the main street. He would take the baby home and then I'd work and then come home after, get up early, get the baby ready, walk to school, catch the train, walk to, you know. And then... Um, Josh started to crawl and walk at school, so I had to quit in about year 11, I think it was, and then I started TAFE and that's when I had my second baby. So I was 18 when I fell pregnant. And what were you studying at TAFE? So that was, I think I think it was office administration or something, something basic. Yeah. Uh, but I just needed to... I knew that I wanted... I was offered a housing commitment because I ended up homeless after that. I moved out into a unit, the lady that lived there wanted to move back. So she said, you need to vacate the property, the, you know. And I couldn't go back to dad's because at this stage I had two kids. My dad had a housing commission house. We had five kids there plus the boyfriends and dad would take in homeless people, drug addicts. Like there was just no more room for me. It was yeah. a, a very dysfunctional home. So I thought, shit, I can't go here. So I stayed on a friend's floor in her land room with no mattress, just the two kids. And I had one, you know, those fold out kitty mattresses. Yeah. Yeah. So I had the bananas in pajamas one and I'd put them both to sleep on that and I'd sleep on the floor. And um, I was still attending TAFE at that stage. So I'd get up, you know, do you remember when Melbourne lost all the heating and hot water for two weeks? Yes, I do. Yeah, it was yeah. then. Yeah, and right. And it was freaking freezing cold. It was so cold. So we had no heating, no hot water, living on a freaking land room floor with no <laughs> nothing. Um, on your bananas and pajamas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But to me, it was nothing because I was so used to dysfunction. So I wasn't even really that stressed. It was just, you know, like if it, if I was in that situation now, I'd probably freak right out. But I was like, oh, whatever. You know, it, it's it just like even... the baseline was already there. Yeah, the standard was already there. So it, it wasn't too far from where you'd come from. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't that. Brutal as what – that's why it doesn't affect me talking about it because I don't remember it being a really tough situation yeah. for me back then. Um, and so I still continued TAFE and, yes, yeah, that's right. So when I was homeless, I um, I remember waking up one day because when I was eight I used to walk to the milk bar with Dad and I saw a man being hit and killed by a car and I was absolutely fascinated with seeing this man being hit and killed and I'm like, I want to know where he's going and what's happening and – Got home and I'm like, Dad, I wouldn't – you stop nagging Dad. And it's like, I said, where's this man going? And he took me to a funeral home and he said, for fuck's sake, Stacey, this is where – you know, and I said, oh, so they're looking after him and he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So at the age of eight I discovered my passion and that was to become a funeral director. Wow. I know. So that's something I wanted but I didn't ever think that I could achieve. Like it wasn't – it was just in the back of my head that's what I want to do. So when I was homeless – I remember waking up one morning and I remember distinctively I was wearing my Adidas, you know the, when you go to a market and you get those fake Adidas trackies? Yeah. So I used to dress like a boy. I never did makeup. I dressed like a boy. Bomber jacket. Yeah, and I'd only ever go to the boys' section, uh, you know, uh, I was like a boy. So I had my um, fake Adidas tracky pants on, my boys' runners and a billabong jumper or whatever, and I woke up thinking I don't want to face a day like – because I'd go to TAFE three days a week but on the day, days off I'd hang out at Macca's all day with the two kids because I had nowhere to take them. I didn't want to sit in the land room at my friend's house because it was the house, the place I was staying in was in a bungalow in her mum's backyard. 
So it wasn't like it, you know, it was tiny. And then I felt embarrassed because I thought I'd only be in this situation for a week, but I was overstepping the the mark and and I was, you know, a bit embarrassed that I couldn't find a place. So I thought, I don't want to freaking hang out at Macca's all day today again. Like this is just boring with the two kids. And I think Talia must have been sick. She was only a baby. It was just full on. So I thought, stuff this, I'm going to go and knock on the funeral guy's home. And I saw the kids up. This is me back then. Not I look back now and I'm like, oh, my God. And I knocked on the door and I said, listen, can I speak to the manager? And she's like, yeah. So the manager comes out and I said, listen, mate, I'm freaking homeless at the moment. I've got two kids, but my dream is to work here. Can I have a job? And he's like, oh, yeah, come back another time. I said, okay, cool. So I went down to Dad's and um, I used to collect all the job advertisements out of the paper of being a funeral director. So I went back to Dad's and I got all my stuff out. I had them all in a plastic sheet and I went down to the TAFE and I said, listen, can you help me put together a pretend resume? He said, come back. Anyway, so I put the kids into the childcare the next day at the TAFE and I went down there and I put together a pretend resume and I knocked on the door and I said, listen, can I have a job here, you know? Um, can I speak to the manager? And he comes out and I said, oh, I'm back. You told me to come back. <laughs> and he's like, oh, like that? I'm thinking, <laughs> looking back now, but at the time I didn't care. And um, he ended up, he did look at it and he tweaked a few things. He said, take some out, put some in. And I'm like, you beauty. And, off I, and he said to me, go and get a traineeship in office environment so that you can get your foot in the, the door of an office funeral parlour, but just get an office job anywhere. And I'm like, cool. So I went and printed out three resumes and I got knocked back by three and I thought, that's it. I'll never, ever achieve that dream like that's. And I gave up. I gave up on that dream thinking I wasn't good enough. Like I was just a piece of shit. Everyone told me I was a scumbag. You know, I always got told I'm just a drop kick and a scumbag and um, I'm just a, you know, you, you the shit that I've been called is just unbelievable. Did you, when that those names were put upon you and those labels were, were, were given to you, did you ever like adopt and identify with them or did, was there a part of you that inside was like, no, I'm not and I'm going to fucking show you otherwise? No, it wasn't even about I'm going to show you. It was more how rude. How, why do you think that of me? Because I didn't. So you didn't identify? No, no yeah, not good. at all. I do remember one lady rang me up years are like saying you've ruined my life my husband's life your life everyone's lives and I'm like why though like I look back now and I can see why she thought that and then I went and met another uh, boyfriend one day and I had the two kids I was single and I thought I was a decent person and she's looked at her son and she goes oh god your brother wouldn't pick up a girl off the gutter with two kids and I'm just like oh geez that's a bit rude so I never and then I was caught ordered to go to counselling um and my counsellor told me about a year later that the lady in the office said to her, that Stacey girl's way too far to be gone. She can't be helped. And I, but I never. What led to court ordering counselling? Okay, so th- this, is, this is where I'm getting at. So when I was homeless, yeah. I, when, so I wanted to go. I got knocked back from the funeral job. Yeah. I went back to Dad's that night. Cracked the shits with dad. Me and him had a massive ass fight. We always did. I grabbed the kids and I was walking back to the floor to where I sleep. And I'm thinking, fuck, I need to change my life. Like this is just, I, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, you know. I can't, now I don't even, I don't even have a dream anymore. I've been knocked back. And um, so I remember lying there thinking I have to change my life. But it, And I know it was a Friday night because I'd already arranged to go to the um, nightclub on the Saturday night, that was already planned, that was done. So I thought, right, I'll wait till Sunday and then I'll fully change my life. That's it. I'm going to change my life on Sunday. And I went out night clubbing and, yeah, I met a guy and, I, was, you know, dancing with a hot guy and another hot guy and the, the other guy ends up bashing some guy and I went back home to Dad and I said, Dad, I have met the hottest guy. Like he is the man of my dreams, Dad. And Dad's like, oh, good on you, love. I wasn't in a good place in my life and it became very volatile, this relationship. So, um, and I had another baby and that's when DHS got involved. Right. So there was a lot of domestic violence in that relationship and I ended up at the Royal Children's Hospital and I was in a tiny room, probably this size, and I had the federal police and the DHS and the hospital staff telling me that I had two choices as of right now and they have the, the they've got the foster families all organised and they said, um, you've got two choices, you can lose your kids, uh, 
yeah, if you stay with this in this abusive relationship and all three kids will be placed in foster care tonight, like right now, they've like they had the foster families everything. Wow. Or um, the second choice is you can keep your kids but you must change your life. So for 12 weeks you're court ordered to have nothing to do with your partner. You have to attend domestic violence counselling and your dad has to live with you for 12 weeks. Was that your come to Jesus moment where you literally was like, right? Absolutely. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. That was to have my they, – they, my kids meant the world. I, I know it sounds dysfunctional but I had the most – close relationship with my kids. They were my world. They yeah, still right. are. Um, they were my everything, as you can imagine. So to almost, I remember I was on my knees begging them to just please don't take my kids off me. I'll do everything. And I do remember leaving there scared, shitless thinking, but how am I thinking? I didn't say this to them because I didn't want them to know my fear, but I was thinking, I thought I was living the dream life, like I've got the dream guy. I He wants me and my kids. I'm not single anymore. I'd been homeless previous and I had a unit. I had a roof over my head. I honestly thought that this, I was living the dream. Um, I didn't know how dysfunctional my relationship was. I couldn't believe that they're telling me to change my life. Like what's this other life? I've got no idea. So I was scared because I didn't know how to change my life. I literally thought it was perfect. So that was really scary. Um, and so what came next? You made, did you, make, you obviously made the shift. You made the move. Yeah, so I was court ordered to go to counselling and I right. was angry when I turned up. I was like, why? I'm not black and blue. I don't have bruises or like – because I – back then domestic violence wasn't spoken about like it is now. I had no – you know, I didn't know what domestic violence was. I imagined it was that you're beaten up and you're bruised and I wasn't. And um, I remember – my first counselling session and I was so pissed off that I had to be there. I didn't want to be there. I wanted my boyfriend, like, you know, I was obsessed with him and he was obsessed with me and how dare they take him away from me. And um, and I was angry and I was blaming everything on everyone else in that in that room. And my counsellor said, what do I do? Like, what? how do I change my life? Well, what am I meant to do? I don't know what, what to do. She said, read a book. And I said, no, I freaking hate books. I'm not reading books because I didn't read books. And I said, I don't have any money anyway. And she goes, go and hire a book from the library. And I said, because oh. I started to trust this counsellor after a while. And I went and read this book, The Courage to Heal. And it had all of these bloody stories like mine. And I'm like, wow. And it had tips and tools to implement to your life. And I just started to implement these little tiny different strategies into my life, eating healthy, exercising, because I was, take away all the the drama and the fighting and abuse and chaos and because that's all I was ever used to. That was your baseline. That, yeah, and I had none of that and I was bored shitless, man. Like yeah. I was so uncomfortable. All right. So uncomfortable. Because you almost thrived in the chaotic environment, did you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I needed something to replace that adrenaline. Yeah, right. So I started exercising and, and getting the kids in the pram at night and running with them and um, – you know, and and I and I could see my life in that twelve weeks. I could see such huge shifts. I remember I used to go to counselling on a Tuesday, and I'd walk into the school every day. I was embarrassed because I was the youngest mum there, and you know, you, dysfunct. But where word gets around at how you know things, and um, I remember walking through the school and feeling a bit embarrassed. But every day after um, counselling, I'd walk in there. The self-esteem was high, the confidence was high, and I just felt amazing. And um, so I started to see I was getting on a level with my kids that I'd never been on a level with them before, but I was always close with them. But I was now reading with them, spending time with them. There was no fighting. It was bizarre. And, it, and then we had a huge court case, so I had to get a barrister and a solicitor because I had to still prove to the courts that I was a fit mum for 12 whole weeks. Mm. So I had to do the right thing for 12 weeks. And I was so I was thinking they've got video cameras on me and I was really felt like I had I had to be a good person and I wasn't allowed to have friends. They didn't tell me, but I had a lot of dysfunctional friends, toxic friends. So I got rid of all of them. And in each book that I saw, I got addicted to reading books. And they all said, you become the top five people you're hanging out with. And I started to think, shit, man, look at the people I've got in my life. 
But then they said, go and find other people. And I'm thinking, but they, all these other people would not want to hang out with me because I'm a dropkick. So I just have to be lonely and be on my own for a while. But then the 12 weeks was up. I won full custody and I was allowed to go back to living my life. And I was really bored. I'm thinking, well, I don't know what to do with myself, you know, really uncomfortable. Like, why? And I craved the toxic drama back. So I found new friends and I got back into partying again, not for long, because I then started to think, you know, every time. So I got into, um, I met a girl at a community centre where it says, change your life, come to this workshop. So me and her clicked and she brought all of her people over and they're smoking chuff and I'm like, oh, God, now I'm meeting people. I thought she'd be a positive yeah. person. So then I started to get involved with these other people and I'm like, nah, you know what? And so I started to play a game with myself and it was like every time I had to give myself a choice, I'd give myself the two choices like DHS had given me. Wow. Yeah. So every time somebody would say to me, let's go and get smashed at a nightclub, I'd say, Stacey, you've got two choices. The first choice, I can palm my kids off to my dad, go and get smashed or choice two, I can stay home with my kids, keep reading my books, be lonely, and then I'll attract positive people into my life. And then I'd say, you know, which choice is going to have your kids removed? And I'd say get rid what of choice one. What a powerful one. construct. Yeah. And that was very conscious. Conscious, mate. And I was, so it's, I started to make conscious choices every single, every moment that I had to make a choice, I was now making conscious choices. And that changed my whole life. And so what age are you here on the timeline? 21. 21. Yep. Yep. It absolutely changed even my anger because I had anger issues. <laughs> um, where You know, choice one, I can lose my shit and react to someone stirring me up or choice two, stay calm, be a better mum and a better role model which choice will have my kids removed? Well, the, the first choice is going to wow. wow. Stacey, get rid of choice one. And that's why my message is good riddance because I talk about people say, focus on what you do want. Focus on this, do a vision board of what you do want. Bullshit. I say focus on what you don't want and get rid of the shit. <laughs> yeah. That's really, really true. But not just focus on what you don't want. Focus on the absolute worst case scenario of losing the most important thing in your life. Yeah. Because it's interesting that you say that. Like I, I unwittingly do something very similar with my son. Um, you know, I've had seven near-death experiences, and so I've 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 tasted mortality, and so as a result, <clears throat> I developed this uh, ability to just deal with the potential for fear, for death. And I was like, you know what? If if I die, you know, I've nearly died seven times, no big deal. But then all of a sudden, my son comes along, and the fear of death came back into my life again because I was like, fuck! Now I need to now I need to be here. I want to be here. There's something greater than myself that I want to be here for. And so in the mornings now, and this is kind of hysterical because I'm someone that likes to be on time. I'm very regimented, you know, boundaries, structures, you know, because I'm a, I'm an addict. So for me, in order to live in a very healthy way, I need structure. I need boundaries. I need discipline. But when it's when I'm with my son, I always make the decision, like in the mornings, it's like, okay, I can spend an extra 20 minutes with my son and we can be late for school, okay, or I can rush him right now and we'll probably be a little bit of a tanty and we'll be at school on time but one of us may not come home tonight. Mm. And if he didn't come home, which choice would I be happy with? Yeah. And so as a result, <laughs> we'll, we got to school at 9.30 this morning <laughs> and I walked into the lady and she's like, because they're used to it with me. And he's, look, he's four and three quarters. It's not yeah, like yeah. he's in fucking high school. But yeah, um, yeah but they're used to it now because I decided, oh, we just decided to spend some, you know, some extra daddy time. You know, oftentimes we'll go to the coffee shop, have a, he'll have a baby chino and we'll yeah. just hang out. So yeah, I can, I can completely relate to that. So at this point, your psychology started to have this massive shift yeah. and it was becoming very conscious. Had you entertained the idea of starting a business at this point? No, no, not at all. So that's when I, so reading all of these books, I realized how toxic my life is and I couldn't trust myself after the 12 weeks when I said I was going back. I just couldn't trust myself to make the right friendships because I kept attracting similar people. Yeah. And um, so I thought, okay. That's a great awareness. Yeah. Well, I thought for 12 weeks I was really good. 
And I, I tell you what, I was dealing with barrister solicitors. It was the most inspiring 12 weeks of my life. The, At age 21. Yeah. yeah. The work I was doing with, like I was learning about the cycle of domestic violence. It was, I was hungry for all of this knowledge that I was learning. So I thought, okay, if I've behaved myself for the 12 weeks and proved myself through exercise, eating healthy, reading books, I've had no friends, I've done, mate, what if I do that for 12 months? What if I do the same thing for 12 months? I'm not going to have one friend in my life for 12 months. I, that, I made that decision. Wow, break the cycle. And um, so 21 and, and so I had no one. And you imagine, you know, you, those values, things where you do your wealth, health and, you know, my wealth, I was on a single parent pension. Um, health was, it was okay but family was drama and my hobbies were partying and stuff. You know, take all that away. I've got nothing in my life, Right literally nothing. And again, I was bored. Shit. And you were like, you're an addictive kind of person. You got to, you run with adrenaline, yeah. right? Now, when I was in a, in toxic stuff, I created a monster. I was really good at it. I had nowhere to put this adrenaline. I'm like, I need to put it somewhere. Are you ADHD? So, I've never been diagnosed okay. with ADHD. Yeah. Um, I just, yeah, I just think I've lived with a lot of anxiety without knowing it yeah. from a child. Yeah. From Understood. birth, yeah, <laughs> without yeah. knowing it, yeah. So it's in in me, yeah. And um, so I couldn't sit still with myself at all. And I thought, shit, man, what if I go and now I've got no one in my life telling me I'm a shit kicker. I've only got my own tiny little bit of self belief in your own voice now. My own voice, yeah. Not one other person's, yeah. right? And I deliberately took everyone out of my life. So I went back to that. I went back to another, the TAFE that I went because I had to go do another course to how, learn how to dress like a girl. <laughs> <laughs> There's so a course at TAFE for that? Yeah, on, on <laughs> etiquette, on how, yeah, to right. dress, how to wear heels and nice clothes, like a girl to yeah, dress right. up, right? How I not was, to dress like a gangster. I was t- my counsellor suggested I go and do that because I was dressed like a bogan, right? So I go to this course on how to dress like a girl and how to, you know, present well. You're awesome. And um, so I go and do that and... I thought, right, I'm going to, I feel a bit more confident now. I'm going to go for this job, funeral director. I wonder if I get it. So I printed out the, so I got knocked back three times, right? And yep. thinking I'm never going to get that. So this time I thought, stuff it, I'm going to print out 50 copies. And because I'd been to court, I bought myself a business suit back then. Yeah. And I used my rent money back then because I couldn't afford it. But I knew if I wanted to be taken serious <laughs> by, the bar, the, by the lawyer, so I went over to Meyer and bought myself a pinstripe business suit. I thought, right, I'll get that bloody pinstripe business suit out. And I went and knocked on about 50 doors to ask for a traineeship around all the factories around my house. And sure enough, on the 50th door, you know, I got knocked back, knocked back 49 times. On the 50th door, I got offered an, a, a, an apprenticeship, traineeship. So that was in um, accounting as an accounts assistant. And I couldn't believe when I won this job, right? I was so freaking excited. So it was five days a week, full time. I had the three kids, but I was loving it. I couldn't believe I was earning 280 bucks a week. Like I felt so rich. And um, and I, my confidence was just through the roof. And I was able to move from the dodgy little unit. It was 140 bucks a week. It was a shit house unit. But at the time I thought it was amazing. And because I'd been homeless before, right? Mm. So I was able to move over the hill into the rich area <laughs> and I was so excited and I've shown the kids and then I was able to buy us a new car because my other car was a VB Commodore and, you know, there was no heating, no hot water or anything like that and heating, no heater, no air conditioner. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, my God, kids. And Josh would have been about 16, 17, 8, 9, 20, 20, 20. About seven, at six, seven at the time. So he understood cars and so me and him went and chose the car and went driving around and it was so exciting. And uh, I was in a, it's a little house. It was only rented. But to me, it was like a, a mansion. Yeah, it was, it was beautiful. And um, so I won that traineeship and I was meant to conquer it in four years. But because I still had no friends at that time, I still deliberately wouldn't meet anyone. I was reading my books. I was getting to work earlier, finishing earlier, picking up the three uh, three kids, dropping them off early. I smashed out that traineeship in three years instead of four. Wow. And I got nominated for Optus Outstanding Student. They kept all my work as examples because it was all high distinctions. Like, wow. I was really kicking ass with this job, right? My boss loved me. 
Um, he used to call me, he's, you know, good morning, my little chickadee. He really <laughs> liked me. He was actually, he was a classical ballet guy, loved ballet. Yeah, right. And he said, used to say to me, by the time I'm finished with you, Stacey, I'm going to have a, you're speaking with a plum in your mouth. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't know about that. But anyway, he took me under his wing and taught me everything about accounting and he gave me all these massive ass jobs that I never in my dreams thought I could achieve and I did and I used to kick ass. He's like, fuck, Stacey, like, you're amazing. And, oh, really? So it boosted my self-esteem and confidence. Anyway, seven years I'd been knocking on this funeral guy's door, mate. <laughs> Every six months with the traineeship, I'd yeah, knock right. and say, mate, this is where I'm, I'm at. Here. This is where I'm at. This I'm is... still here. And I'd never forget it. The day I, the last day I turned up, I was dressed in a halter neck dress because I started to dress like a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and I could afford nice clothes and makeup. And it was a black and white halter neck dress and I had my stilettos. And I walked in, I said, listen, mate, I've finished my traineeship. They've, I've finished it three years ahead of schedule instead of four, uh, one year ahead of schedule. And they've kept all my jobs as examples and I've been nominated for Optus. And he sat back and he's like, Stacey, I think you're ready. And he said, there's actually a job going and I want you to go for it. And I said, oh, my God. And so I got that job and I was so excited. I got the uniform and I danced around the lounge room with the kids and I was so excited. But um, so then... So I was living the dream, right? So yeah, then I've you're attracted now funeral director now, and I'm funeral director's assistant. Right, so I had okay. to start ground up. So where I worked in the trainee, I met a guy there, and he was a dick. And I'd be sitting in my office, and he'd always walk past and throw papers at me. And I'd, th- I'd say to the girls, "This guy's a wanker, mate." Like, and every time on my lunch break, I want to read my newspaper, and he'd sit, and I'm like, "Fuck yeah, hi." <laughs> and then he'd talk, and I'm like. Yeah, <laughs> and I'd be like, this guy's just... Let me guess, you married him now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was the total opposite of what I'd normally go for. Which is why there was no Total attraction. opposite, yeah. right? Anyway, um, so I was living the dream. I've got the dream. I've got this guy I can't even believe likes me. Like, God, he's such a nice guy. He never yells at me, doesn't swear at me. Nothing. Still in 13 years. He's never called me a bitch or anything, right? Wow. Never. Never yelled at me, right? Wow. Anyway, he's a nice You are a bit guy. of a force. He could be a bit afraid. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No. no. And um, so perfect life. And then I'm driving to work one day, living the dream that I could, can't even imagine. And then I got called into the school. Uh, the principal tells me I need to come, I need to come. I'm like, well, can't you wait? I've got a new job. Like I don't want to. No, you need to get in here now, Stacey. This is urgent. So I get in there and she tells me my son's tried to commit suicide and he's only, you know, a young boy. How old was he at the time? Nine. Wow. So um, I don't know if about you, if, if you know, but when you leave domestic violence, the kids usually for years after, they suffer a lot unless you go and get help, you know, the anxiety, the panic attacks, the... Um, depression, a lot of this stuff just gets worse. So as my life was just getting better and better, I didn't realise but my son's life, he wasn't coping with all the trauma that he'd been through and all of a sudden wow. he's out of it and he's not dealing with it. So I am drive I drive home into my house and I'm thinking I have to quit. I can't do my job. I need to be able to take my son with me to psychologists and counsellors I can't tell my boss. No one knows at this stage about my secret life. Nobody. It was all I put on this big facade that I was a professional girl, you know. So I didn't want to tell anybody so about So they didn't my, know you had the kids? Oh, uh, I didn't tell them when I got the job. Right. But they did find out after but I didn't let them know how dysfunctional my life was. Yeah, That right. I'd had them at 16, you know, 15 yeah. and pregnant. They didn't know any of that stuff. Yeah. So I didn't want to tell. I was embarrassed about my, my life. So I... um. Went back and I thought, I can't tell them so that they'd understand me. I just have to resign and take Josh. I need to get him into psychologists and counsellors. And I got home and I thought, I'm going to have to go back to the single parent pension. I know where this path is going to lead me. I know giving up this is going to lead me back down a toxic path. It's going to, I'm going to end up back in the unit. Because at the time, me and the boyfriend weren't living together and I never, ever relied on a man financially, ever. So it wasn't like I was thinking, oh, I'll be financially okay with him because he didn't have money. I didn't even know about his money or anything. Um, And I'm like, I'm going to have to go on single parent pension. 
I'm not going to be able to afford the rent in this place. Um, I knew the path that it was going to take and I remember walking into my ensuite and there was a poster that I used to print, uh, put up and it was, your positive attitude can literally rewire your child's brain for health, happiness and mm. self-esteem and confidence. And I used to always look at that, that I because my counsellor, I used to beg her, please tell me that we can change. Can we change our lives? Yes. And I found that poster and that was like, I can rewire. Yeah, hang on to that. You know, so I looked at that and I thought, fuck, you know, the worst thing for my, my boys right now would be for me to go back to my old toxic habits. I have to stay on this right path, but I can't work full time. Can't have a job. What the fuck am I going to do? So Dave, my partner, he used to, he still does as a hobby, races go-karts and he prints little stickers because he's a tight ass. He doesn't like to pay for them. And I said, listen, can I turn your sticker hobby into a business? You know, he wasn't making money or anything. And he's like, no, you don't know about business. He's still working at the place <laughs> that we met, right? Today. Yeah. No, no, no. Back, right, back at this then. stage, right, he's yeah. still working there. And he's like, you don't know about business. And I said, please, I need to do something. I've... I don't need money. I don't. I don't want to get paid. I don't care because I ended up going, having to go back on single parent pension. But it wasn't about the money. I needed something positive to, to put do. my energy because I yeah. you I knew to set the path. an example. Yeah, and I knew that I'd go back to all you know. So I um he goes oh I said just please let me do this. I just need somewhere to take Josh every day and so I got driving along and I found a chair on the hard rubbish because Dad we used to all get heaps of shit off here hard rubbish. So Josh gets out, gets the chair. I've got a camping table that's green and a phone and a laptop and I ended up getting on Yellow Pages and ringing all of these companies and sat there and I did the same shit that I knocked on doors to win my dream job, knock back after knock back and I thought, right, I'm going to ring 100 companies here and I sat there and ringing all day and I got this one lady that's a big company today. I won't say who it is but it was huge and she goes, I'll come in for a meeting and I'm like, yeah, cool. So I went in there and I said, listen, I think I can do some printing I didn't even know about printing, nothing. And I said, I reckon we can do what you need. And she goes, oh, beauty. So we sit down in this big boardroom and she gets out the big um, um, plan. She goes, look, we've got a conference in Queensland and we need all of this printing done, the flags and the banners and all that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, beauty, we can absolutely do that. Walked out and I rang Dave and I said, Dave, I've just won a fucking $30,000 job. <laughs> and he's like, Stacey, I told you not to contact the large cards. He goes, we don't even have any freaking machinery. And I'm like, fuck, you're a negative ass. And I hung up <laughs> and I went and found a, a printer. I said, listen, mate, I've just won this big ass job. Can you print all this stuff for us? So he printed it all for us. And that job, I nailed it. I put a little bit of profit on for us. Yeah. And I repeated that same thing and within six months I'd won jobs with BHB Billet and Clive Peters, Coles Meyer, all oh, these huge companies, man. right? And I'm like, Dave, you need to resign from your job and come and help me in your business. That's how we started. In your business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in the first year of business, and I'm not just making this up to make it sound good, I, I made 300000 worth of sales. Wow. In that first year and I had nothing. Wow. And I, I didn't make money. Yeah. I was, still wasn't getting paid because we're putting margin and, and investing in machinery. And, investing back into the business. You know, and getting into a factory. And, yeah. I so am curious though, like in those, in those phone calls in the early days, two things first and foremost, when you were getting knocked back, what was the talk, were you conscious of the talk track in your head that kept you going or were you just, it was just an initial response, right, got to keep going or were you conscious of the, the story that you were saying to yourself to, to, to keep pushing? No, I was just picking up the phone. To me, it was a game. It was like a game. So you treated it as a game. Second thing, you didn't fuck around with the little guys. You <laughs> BHB right. Billiton. Like you were, was that your mindset? Well, I'm just going to go for the biggest yeah, fucking one I can. Absolutely. I never went for the little ones. It was the biggest mothers. Like I didn't even think to go to the small ones. I was just thinking of the brands. Like who would get printing done? Yeah, who would? Because I didn't oh, know the industry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so straight to the big ones. And um, so 300 grand in your first year. How long ago yeah. was that? Oh, that was about. God, that would have been about, oh, God, eight, nine, ten years ago. And but so we, we're, we're doubling and everything. Like everything's just kicking ass. We're in big factories. I'm buying the BMW car thinking, I'm, you know, I'm fucking living the dream. Here we go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But my sons are still getting off the rail. So Even to present day, you mean? Or Yeah, I've got the 18-year-old who's not settled. He's not bad. He's, yeah. just, he's not on drugs or anything, but... 
my boys need me. Yeah. And do I want to take the business to five mil? Why? Just because it's a game. I can't drive that business as far as I know I can because I, I still need to be there with my boys. Yeah. They still need me. They're number one. Yep, absolutely. And I've thought, you know, I'm like I've, I could build an empire. I know I could. I've yeah. got it. But at the end of the day, if I was to die, what's more important, mm. money or my kids? I'm living comfortable right now. I, you know, I've, I'm comfortable. I'm not wealthy, like I'm not rich, sickly rich, but I've got everything that I need. Uh, and I've got really amazing relationships with my kids. My five kids, I've got five. Wow. Um, You're a breeder, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> me and Dave had two more and that's no more. No, yeah. that's it. Um, Shop shut. Yep, that's it. And But I've got such good close relate. Like my 23-year-old, me and him are so close. My daughter, 21-year-old, we're so – and it's because I've invested so much into their lives and – I know Josh, the boys struggle a lot with their depression and anxiety every now and again and I need to be there for them. And if I'm just constantly in the business, if you know what I mean? You know what it's like. I do. And there's so much stress at work. You, you're like a firefighter. You just go to work putting out fires all fucking day. And then when you've got I, – I just don't – I need to get rid of shit to have enough room for the boys. Um, I mean, even two days ago, you know, I'm taking my son rings me, mum, can we go for a beach walk? And I'm able to do that. Yep, let's go because he's got anxiety and he needs to talk to someone. Yeah, right. And I'm there for them. Now, if I'm, what's the point? Like if I have this huge empire, I'm not able to do that. Mm. And I'm stressed and I'm agitated. And so I had to make that decision in 2017. I said to Dave, I can't. Keep, I think we need to leave it for now, just leave it at the level where it's manageable. I can't because I'm the sales bitch. Yeah. And, you know, it devastates him but he understands because he knows my kids, I nearly lost them. They are my world and and my time will come again when I can focus 100% on me. Are you coming to Nissi? We've got to get you into Nissi. What's that? It's our three-day Mallet and Scarlet program. Yeah, right. We could We could perhaps show you how you can have both. Yeah, right. Yeah, because yeah, I do. Yeah, at the moment I'm. I look. Yeah. I am curious. Like I would say, probably eighty plus percent of our audience are parents. Uh, we attract a huge percentage of you know people who have kids, not just in business, but also just parents in general. But I'm curious to know from you, like, what are some of the things that you do in order to keep that balance? Because for some people, the dollar is very attractive, and they're like, oh. You know, I had this one instance with a client, um, I think it was last year. She said, you know, my, my son just doesn't understand. I have to work all the time because I'm trying to give him the life that I didn't have. Mm. And so I'm curious to you how you balance that. Like, what is the psychology that you use to balance that equation? Like when you do have that that balance issue, like when you do I work or do I spend time with my kids? Um, so my um, – it, it's – yeah – I don't have balance. I wouldn't say, well, like every morning I get up, it's a non-negotiable, I go to gym every yep. morning because, and I don't go to gym to look good. My mindset, it does for my mindset. Yep. And I, it's it's just part of me now. Every weekend I um, meal prep. So I know exactly what I'm having all week, me and the kids. I prepare my meals and I prepare theirs. I do school lunches every night without fail. I get their school uniforms done. I've never, ever got a pile of washing. It's done every day, every night, washed, dried, put away. Um, my house is clean every morning before I go to work, spotless. I'm on top of everything, anally routine. You are like military. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to be though yeah. because it gives me space to deal with my kids. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to run the business and I'm able to go and speak and I'm able to because I look after myself. I don't drink alcohol. I... My social life is not – that's neglected because I've got more priorities. I'm fine – I find people – I'm a bit weird, so I struggle to find people like me to hang out with. I don't want to waste my time hanging out with just normal people in society that just want to drink piss and talk shit and gossip and drama and I'm not interested and there's not many people out there that don't do that. Mm. So I'm very picky with who I allow in my life now, very picky. I've got some, you know, really good close friends but there's not many so I don't have to care about being social all the time and that. So I look after myself in that way. 
Um, I'm just anally routine. I get home, you know, I cook, I prepare dinner in the morning. So that's all prepared. So when I walk through that door at night, I just cook it. It's done. Um, and I just get shit done. I just so do it. structure and discipline are a huge part of what you do. Yeah. And from what I'm hearing, it's that structure and that discipline that creates a level of freedom that you then invest into your kids. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I learned that at 21 when I had the full-time traineeship. I was a single mum, three kids. I had to make this traineeship work. So I had to learn discipline Yeah, right. and routine. Because prior to that, you didn't have any? Never. I was scattered all over the joint. And that's how I ended up smashing that traineeship a whole year off was discipline and my routine because I was so structured. And now I've just continued it. That's part of my life. Like I go to bed early, I get up early, do the gym. I fit everything that most people say they can't do, Um, you know, and and then I've still got time at the end of the day. So when my kids text me, because they always do, one of them does, at the end of the day, mum, you up for a walk? Yep, beauty, let's go. I'm able to do that. And you've got that kind of relationship where they yeah. can talk to you about their issues. Oh, they every yeah, all the time. They come to me. I am like their psychologist, seriously. And I know that you don't want to be the rescuer and all that, but I've got them into psychologists and stuff. And they don't, they can't do what I've been able to do with them. And that's why most people will say, "Oh, let them go." You know, they're old enough now. But they come to me and open up and everything. They'll always be your kids. Yeah, yeah, and I can't yeah. give up on them. I a child's don't. brain isn't fully developed until they're almost 30, age 27, 28. Well, there you go. Yeah, and they need their, their you know, they need maternal support until that, you know, until – and do you know what's really interesting? We've got a great um, client that we work with called Dr. Vanessa Lapointe and, you know, because a lot of people say, oh, the goal of a great parent is to create independent children. She goes, absolutely not. The goal of a great parent is to create dependent children. I like that, yeah. Because – Dependent children are children that will go to their maternal, their their parental figure and ask for support because they need it. Wow. And dependent children create independent adults. Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing that going, fuck me, that's profound. Wow. You know, because oftentimes the whole, and we see, I see parents doing this with, you know, kids at the age of four and five. Oh, I want them to, you know, gain some independence. The kids, you know, even at the age of four and five, independence to a child is, is, is insecurity. It's unsafe. Yeah. They need a big person around them in order to make the world safe. And that's our job. Wow. So, yeah, that was profound for me. And also around discipline, I don't know if you've experienced this yourself. Like it sounds like you've got a great relationship with your kids. But I, I learned this incredible uh, lesson through Vanessa as well where she said, you know, slow is fast. You know, there's certain disciplinary techniques that we can use on small children that might get you the result really quickly. But once they get to an age where you can no longer use threat or intimidation or physical size against them, they will fucking rebel against you. Yeah. So in the earlier years, it's important to learn how to negotiate, learn how to influence, learn how to get them to comply because they want to, not because you can physically intimidate them, not because you can actually threaten to take things away, not because you can actually impose your will by picking them up and carrying them somewhere. Because mm. once a child reaches a physical size where they're no longer afraid of you or intellectually yeah. intimidated, they will rebel. Yeah, well, that's what my 18-year-old actually, he became a violent kid. Wow. Well, he had a lot of anger. A lot of anger. And I actually had to get a restraining order in the house that he can't be violent to me because it was so bad. Wow. You know, yeah. As a child, he was fine. He was not, not fine, sorry. The, the anger, I knew it was anxiety. So I'd, I'd help him and talk to him through it. But as he got to 14, 15, he was now taller than me. It was getting a bit scary, like the, some of the threats and stuff. And I didn't know how to deal with this because with you're taught in domestic violence. It was the absolute cycle of domestic violence that I was living in with my son, you know, and you're taught to get rid of, get out of it, get out of the relationship. But when it's your son and you love him, I I struggle. And I put up with a lot of years of him being abusive and and angry towards me um, because I kept saying, oh, it's okay. He's it's because of his childhood. and But it got to the point where I thought, mate, if I don't do something, he's going to go and continue on with his girlfriend or his it, daughter. That becomes a template of how you treat a woman. Yeah. So I had yeah. to go get a restraining order and stop that. And he hasn't been violent since. But that's the first time I had to give up on my son. And that was the most heartbreaking time of my life to think. I honestly felt like I'd given up on him. But I've done him the biggest favour. Yeah, no Because kidding. I didn't put up with it. Um, and still, I mean, like I said, he's not perfect. He hasn't been abusive to me since, but he's still doing dumb shit. 
you know. He's not, 18. He's 18, though. I was worse <clears> than him. And that's why I'm like, <laughs> he's just, he's got to learn his own. This is his journey. He's learning his But lessons. this is also a great example, you know, that kids are messy. Kids are loud. Yeah. Kids make, that's why they're fucking kids. Yeah. They're, they're stretching their limbs to find their boundaries. In some cases, overstretching. Yeah. But that's their job. And yeah. in many cases, that job involves pushing every single button that we have on yeah. our on our circuit and finding ones we didn't even know that we had. But that's why I still want to be there for him. Absolutely. You know, because he is going through that turmoil time yeah. and I didn't have parents to go to. Like, and I think if I had it, maybe I could have got, you know, wouldn't well, have gone all through that destruction. But I think that disruption made you who you are today. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. if you weren't who you are today, maybe you wouldn't be able to relate at the level that you do to your kids. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that is, you know, that's, you know, a huge part of your gift. Yeah. Um, and I relate in so many ways. You know, it's only been in, the, in uh, this year where I started having a, what, what I would refer to as a tangled hierarchy because I thought my purpose on this planet was to help people. Yeah. You know, and to help people and that was going to be my mission, build a billion-dollar organisation in the process of doing it. And now I've got this four and, a quarter, four and three quarter year old and I'm starting to realise, holy shit, my purpose isn't to change the world. My purpose is to be a father. Mm. And um, I'd rather have a a $20 million business rather than a billion dollar business and be the most incredible father That's on right. the planet yep. versus being a billion dollar business and having a child that has, you know, adopted yes. all of my dysfunction as a result. But what's interesting, and, I, and I'm curious if you can relate because, you know, dysfunction is a cycle. We pass it on to our kids. Uh, and for me, you know, I've I, I've had my own journey. And look, I, I, I think we can always rationalize. And I think I had a great childhood, but, you know, there's a great book that sums up childhood. It's got, written by a guy called James Oliver and the book is called, it's about parenting and it's called They Fuck You Up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I discovered that all the wounds that I developed through my traumas in my childhood, I'm now getting the opportunity to heal as a result of being a father because I see those behaviors coming up and being conscious of it. I was like, no, nah, well, I don't want to be my mom. I don't want to be my dad in that context. Okay, I've got to heal this. And so what I'm discovering is by being, putting my son first, I'm actually becoming a better father, but I'm also becoming a better human being. And by becoming a better human being, I'm becoming a better businessman. I'm becoming a better leader. I'm becoming a better, a better at being able to help people and, you know, essentially make a difference in the world. Yes. Do you find the same thing within your own life that the, the better you become as a parent, the better you are able to navigate the rest of your life, your business and the rest of your world? Absolutely. And, and I remember when I had to learn about the brain of the developing child because my sons were going through such trauma. So I started to research the, the brain of a child that's been in domestic violence. And I was learning about neuroplasticity and I'm like, oh, oh my wow. God, you can actually rewire the yeah. child's brain. And I think that I was rewiring my stuff too at the yeah. same time by learning all this. And it, one of the things that the, the guy said, one of the psychologists said is, you know, if for every three um, po positives, if you have one negative, you need three positives to overcome that negative. Wow. And he said, but positive thinking is very superficial. This is Dr. Rick Hansen. And he said, what you need is positive experiences. You need to, mm. you know, and so I started to put my kids and me in positive experiences, not just telling them positive things. Mm. And I start, and I reckon I was rewiring my brain because I took my kids, I will never forget it, I took them on a holiday to the Gold Coast. I'd never been on a holiday before. Packed up, I was about 23, got the three kids on a plane. It was the most amazing experience of my life. I'd never, I still can't even experience playing that feeling. And um, from that moment, I started to do these other positive experiences and I reckon I was rewiring their brains. And what's my point in this? I had a good point, but, you know, um, I reckon I was rewiring a lot of my stuff. Mm. And You're yes, healing your own childhood wounds. when my kids are going well, my whole life goes well. Everything, home, the, the business, my life, Everything when my kids, and that's why I'm. It's I, there's no point in me not working on my kids because everything else turns to the shit shooter. So yeah. I might as well. <laughs> I've got to. <laughs> you know, so yeah, I'm so with you on that one. Uh, Stacey, I've got to say this has actually been a bit of a surprise. Like I, um, I didn't know a lot about you coming in, but uh, doing a little bit of research before, I was like, yeah, this will be interesting. But now hearing your story, I've got to tell you, this has actually been incredibly inspirational. Oh, thank you. And I was brought up by a single mum on a pension. Yeah. Uh, there was two of us, and um, you know, I'm now a single dad, and I only have my son half the time. And I, I sit there and I wonder how the fuck <laughs> did she do it with two. You know, you had three at the age of 23 and, you know, you've you've now gone on to become an incredible entrepreneur. 
Yeah, I know you've been nominated for the Telstra Woman of the Year. You've been featured by ABC's 7.30 report. You've been in The the Age, BRW, uh, guest reporter on Channel 9 Morning Show and, and featured on The Circle, Carrie Ann Show and The Current Affairs, The Herald. Like you've, you've literally hit, you know, mainstream with the success that you've had. And I really want to honor that. And I really want to acknowledge the journey that you've had because, you know, it's been very clear that the journey that you've had has made you who you are today. Yeah, thank uh, you. And it's been a real honor and a real pleasure and inspiration to, to connect with you. But before we wrap it up, if there's one thing that you'd like to leave the listeners that are listening to this podcast with, uh, you know, one major thing that you, you're really passionate about right now, what, what would it be? I think my, if I look at the, the, the re, you know, they say, what's your purpose in life? I think seriously, my purpose is to, because I've thought about, do I really want to be doing this? Because I keep getting asked to do interviews and speaking on stage and stuff. <coughs> Why am I doing it? Because I don't want to just keep telling my story because to me it gets boring. But my purpose is to get people to take responsibility for their own lives and know that they don't have to blame other people. Just take responsibility for your own life and you will see amazing and incredible things that you never knew existed. Like you'll tap into this potential that you didn't even know is there when you take full responsibility for yourself. So I think that that's my purpose is... To help people you know. take responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I heard a great quote by Will Smith because I used to bang on about everything is your fault. And if you want to do something about it, it's up to you. And But he actually articulated better. He said everything is your fault. He said everything may not be your fault, but it is your responsibility if you want to do something about it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just want to thank you for your time. Stacey, this has been a real pleasure. Thank you oh, so thank much. You. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Stacey Curry. This is Unstoppable. There you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And do me a favor, don't forget to drop me a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear what you think. I love reading what you guys have to say. And your reviews make sure we keep creating killer content just like this. If you want to stay up to date with me and all my movements, please jump onto the website, kerwinray.com. And also check us out on social media, at Kerwin Ray.